believe in Jesus. I believe he rose from the dead. I believe that he is coming again. I believe he died on the cross. Those are correct truths from the Bible. Well, just believing them, what does the rest of the verse say? Even the demons believe and tremble. So you're getting the idea it needs to be deeper than just an intellectual assent. Even the devils acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. But do they know him? Do they worship him? Do they obey him? Even the demons believe that there is one God, the Bible says. What does it mean to know God? Jesus said this is eternal light, that you would know God. That's a relationship, biblically. Adam and Eve, Adam knew his wife Eve. Jesus said this is eternal life to know God. So hopefully more than just a external series of truths, we will understand a relationship with Jesus Christ that is deepened through our study of the Word of God. Another direction we could go tonight, the apocalyptic prophecies of Revelation and Daniel cannot be understood. Do you know what the word revelation means? The word revelation means to be revealed. And there are ideas out there that you can't understand the book, which the name of it is The Revealing. Well, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? The very name of it, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Bible says. It says in Matthew 24 that we ought to understand Daniel. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, what does it say about Daniel? Whoever reads, let him, what's that next word? Understand. Does Jesus say that we can understand Daniel? Absolutely, not just can understand, but we must understand it. Listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, can you obey the book of Revelation without understanding it? Well, of course not. We want to hear and obey and understand the Word of God. Daniel and Revelation can absolutely be understood. Now, those are directions we could go tonight. You're like, Scott, you totally cheated because this is seven deadly myths, and you just hit a bunch of them as like an introduction, and you haven't gotten to myth number one tonight. Well, I had to slide all those in because they didn't make the cut in the top seven, but they're important things, right? So we are going to see what tonight's myth number one is. But before I do that, to, to revisit a, a comment from, from the, 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 the James, James where he said, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the believe, demons believe and shudder. Be clear on this, that the devil's belief in God is different than the Christian's belief in God. Do you understand? The devil's belief in God, Lucifer fell from heaven. He knows that the God of heaven is there. So simply, do you believe in God? Have you ever heard that before? And the idea of just simply believing in the existence of God would not be sufficient for salvation, to know Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about salvation. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of Bible truths. But just to make sure that was clear from James. Now, they did a survey a number of years ago of Christians. And they asked Christians six questions in a six-question survey. And they wanted to see... Okay, Christians who have made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that is important to them today, do they agree with these six basic Christian teachings? And they went through, do you agree or disagree with these six? The first one, do they believe that absolute moral truth exists? Number two, do they believe that the Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles it teaches? Number three, do they believe that Satan is a real being, not merely symbolic? Do, number four, do they believe a person cannot earn their way into heaven by works? Number five, Christ lived a sinless life on earth. Number six, God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules the universe today. Now, you're all looking at those six and you're saying, yeah, amen to all of those, right? If I were to ask for a show of hands among Bible-believing Christians, do you agree with every one of those statements of truth from God's word? Every hand would go up. This is 100% of Christians would agree with that list, right? Check this out. Before I tell you what percentage of Christians didn't agree with the whole list, if you're not on board with those ones, that's bare bones, basic entry-level Christian teaching, right? I mean, those aren't even all the basics. If there are any one of those that are missing, 
You have something other than Christianity, don't you? You have something lacking there. Here's the answer. These six, only 19% of Christians who were surveyed said yes to those six. Absolute moral truth exists. The Bible is totally accurate in its principles. Satan is real. You can't earn your way to salvation through work, to heaven through works. Jesus lived a sinless life, and God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and the creator. Only 19% of people who have made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that is important in their life today, only 19% of Christians are in agreement. So you can see that we've got a massive problem with an understanding of Bible truth. That's why this series needs to exist, just teaching Bible truth so we can all go, yes, I want to learn more of God's word. And I'm on that journey with everybody as well, by the way. But did you know, 19%, the majority actually of Christians in that survey believed they could earn their way to heaven through works. The majority of Christians in that survey believed Satan is not a real being. A full one-third of Christians in that survey believed Jesus did not live a sinless life. Horrifying thought as that is. How did we get here? Well, here's another fact from you from some studies that have been done. The Barna Research Group discovered that when you look at born-again Christian families, less than one in ten Christian families ever opens the Word of God together during a given week. We're just not studying God's word as self-proclaimed Christians. The Christian community, broadly speaking, simply does not have even close to a fundamental understanding of Bible truth and the authority of the word of God. And so they're falling prey to myths and misunderstandings all over the place. Now, I just used the word fundamental. That's a, that's a key word that I want to dig into just for a moment. Did you hear when the Pope came out a couple of years ago and he condemned what he called fundamentalism? Now, you might have heard that word associated with violent extremists, in which case, yeah, we should condemn that. But a basic definition of fundamentalism, what is that? And what did the Pope say when he condemned fundamentalism? He was not talking about violent extremists. Here's the quote from Pope Francis. He said, A fundamentalist group, although it may not kill anyone, although it may not strike anyone, so we're talking about nonviolent people here, are violent. A fundamentalist group, although it may not kill anyone, although it may not strike anyone, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalism is Violence. Now, that might be confusing. We won't try to decode what that means exactly, but it's, it's a pretty clear defi- uh, de- a condemnation of fundamentalism in a nonviolent sense of the word. Those who are not killing or striking anybody are still violent because they are fundamentalists, and fundamentalism is bad. Well, okay, dictionary definition. You ready from Webster's definition of fundamentalism? A movement of 20th century Protestantism emphasizing the literally interpreted Bible as fundamental to Christian life and teaching. Now, you might say, isn't that just the definition of Christianity, right? It's like a movement of 20th 20th century Protestantism that emphasizes the literally interpreted Bible as fundamental to Christian life and teaching. That's the definition of Christianity, that we believe in the Bible as fundamental to Christian life and doctrine. Uh, The literally interpreted Bible. That means the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. And there are symbols in Revelation, symbolism in in Daniel, in apocalyptic uh, literature in the Bible, apocalyptic prophecy. There are symbols in, in parables, and these symbols have a literal application and meaning. So yeah, we take the Bible at face value, that it is our authority. We go to the Word of God as an authoritative, absolute application to our lives. The definition of fundamental Bible-believing Christianity being condemned from the most well-known supposed progenitor 
of the Christian faith. I would say that that is not the Christian faith at all. And we're going to talk about the papacy actually in this series. But right out of the gates, just full disclosure, this is not a seminar where we come to the Bible with our ideas and we go, this is what I think, this is what I would like for my life. We actually want to reverse that and put God in the position of his rightful place of authority and his word communicated to our lives to dictate how we shall live and be and believe. And we do our best as fallen mortals to say, Lord, mold me, shape me, I humble myself before you. I open my mind to be shaped by your word. But you might say, Scott, is the Bible, somebody might be watching this, like, is the Bible trustworthy? I understand that to be a Christian means to believe in the Bible, but maybe I'm not quite at that point yet of understanding the, the validity, the credibility of the Bible. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you an amazing prophecy from Daniel 9, unbelievable, that's going to show the airtight credibility for the, the Bible, mind-boggling. But, but I just got to put on the screen what the myth is that we're dealing with tonight, and then we'll see about the credibility of the Word of God as well. Myth number one, Christianity doesn't require you to take the Bible too seriously. A fundamental approach to the Bible isn't necessary. A fundamental approach to the Bible isn't necessary. Now, we want to ask basic questions of the Word of God, like, how did we get here? Who am I? Who is God? That takes us back to creation, doesn't it? Let's just think about creation for a moment as this idea of a fundamental approach to the Word of God. What does the Bible say about creation? It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Miraculous, powerful. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now, in Genesis 1, there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. 24-hour periods of time, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. But we get this idea out there, Christians say, no, I'm going to go with theistic evolution. That God directed the evolution of man from lower life forms because science, right? Well, that's what the scientists teach is evolution. And then we're told that to evaluate the evidence, uh, inspired evidence, natural evidence, geological evidence, to evaluate that for ourselves, to weigh the evidence for ourselves and draw conclusions contrary to that of the scientists, we are told is anti-science. But hold on just a moment to disagree with this priest class who have anointed themselves in academia as the authoritative voice of what took place in the origins of mankind would be surrendering our minds. And we want to be individual thinkers to study God's word, to study the evidence. That's a true pursuit of science, isn't it? If we end up with theistic evolution because we've been intimidated into that position of denying a six-day creation, then what do you have? There's no Garden of Eden, is there? If you believe in theistic evolution, you didn't have the creation in that six days. You had animals living for millions of years. And then over millions of years, we evolved into human beings. So there's no sinless Adam and Eve then. There's no, there's no creation, institution of marriage in, in, in Eden, the Sabbath in Eden. Oh, and here's a big one. The whole story of the Garden of Eden is something that was made up, so there's no fall into sin. Oh, if there's no fall into sin, there's no promise of what? The Redeemer, the Messiah to come? You see how insidious this idea of, of, of eroding, ironically, uh, eroding the foundations of the Word of God right at creation? Because you do away with the whole plan of salvation, because you do away with the fall of, of man in Eden. And then the, rest, the restoration of Eden and the new earth, because Jesus came the first time, he's going to restore the second time. I mean, the whole Bible is based upon that original creation story. And what does that do to God's character? If God was directing the process of evolution over millions of years, animals killing each other, slaughtering each other, the strongest survive, kill or be killed, natural selection, right? Survival of the fittest, Darwin taught. You've got a God of love presiding over that and directing that? 
That seems more like a satanic picture of God that says, I will ascend by putting others down, right? So, boy, that's even more dark than atheism itself is theistic evolution. Darwinism makes God to be non-existent. Theistic evolution makes God to be a monster. Pick your poison, I guess. I just believe what the Bible says. Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus said that God made man, male and female, in the garden. He is the creator. I mean, you have this picture of God with Adam building him from the dirt, breathing into him the breath of life. It is a beautiful picture of a God of love who made us in his image. And it's suffice it to say that's literally, the literally interpreted Bible is the basis of the Christian faith and creation being central to that. I have a quote from a wonderful book called The Great Controversy. It says, already in the 19th century, many have come to deny doctrines which are the very pillars of the Christian faith. The great facts of creation, as presented by the inspired writers. The fall of man, the atonement, Jesus on the cross, and the perpetuity of the law of God are practically rejected, either wholly or in part by a large share of the professedly Christian world. Thousands who pride themselves upon their wisdom and independence regard it as an evidence of weakness to place implicit confidence in the Bible. They think it proof of superior talent and learning to cavil at the scriptures and to spiritualize and explain away its most important truth. To cavil means to trivialize, raise little objections about, the th we're standing in objection, we're standing in judgment on the Bible because we're smarter than the inspired writers of the scriptures. That is a dangerous position to stand on because at that point, you're, you're not on a foundation, are you? You're on the shifting sands of human opinion when you don't have the absolute inspired authoritative word of God. So if you're on the fence about the Bible's trustworthiness, I want you to see that trust in the Bible is a supremely rational thing to do. The first question from the skeptic is, well, did Jesus exist? Well, you just consult the secular historians on that. To a person, the answer is most definitely and obviously yes. You look at Josephus, a non-Christian non historian. You look at Tacitus, a Roman historian, Josephus being Jewish. You look at all the Roman historians, every one of them will acknowledge the existence of the first century person, Jesus of Nazareth. Not just the existence, that he died on the cross under Pontius Pilate, that he had disciples that claimed he rose from the dead. We know he did rise from the dead, but the non-Christian sources acknowledge these developments of a bunch of Christians arising and these disciples claiming he rose from the dead. And then Christianity spreads like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire in the first century. So that's all established as well in the secular histories. But then the question of that resurrection story comes up. Oh, it's just legends. It's just made up stories, they say. Because Christianity did spread really fast because there was a story of the resurrection men, because there was an empty tomb that could have been easily disproven, but there was an empty tomb. So how do we make sense of that? Well, they say, myths, legends, it's just made up stuff. You got the wrong culture. The Jewish first century idea was never a myth-making culture. The Hebraic philosophy for going back thousands of years now, was steeped in dates, names, places, history, genealogy, obsessively almost to that point of really being fastidious with your understanding of factual, objective, historical reality. Not a myth-making culture. The least type of myth-making culture that you would find in first century ancient world. So also legends take generations to develop. You know, the, 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 the myth-making of Alexander the Great as being godlike or whatever the Greek mythology might be. Those legends take time to grow and amplify and exaggerate over time. But right over the event of the resurrection, you have Christianity spreading like wildfire in that same generation. So you don't have the time necessary for legends to develop, nor do you have a myth-making culture. The writers of the New Testament, when you look at, okay, what genre of writing is this? They're recording history. In fact, 
when you look at the literary scholars and they analyze the writings, let's just take Luke, for example, who wrote the book of Luke and wrote the book of Acts. They acknowledge that this is some of the best historical writing in the ancient world. Luke was a excellent historical writer, including much detail in his account of Jesus' life and in the account of the early church in the book of Acts. And not just the quality of the writing, not just the fact that it belongs to the genre of historical writing, not legend, but also the textual evidence that we have that these are the original writings of Luke and of Paul and of Matthew, etc. Because we have so many copies of these early, early writings of the New Testament. And I should give you by comparison... Everything that we know as historians about the ancient world from a secular perspective, the Greek Empire, what the Greeks did, what the Romans did, everything that we know about ancient history comes from very old documents of historians that wrote at the time. Now we have a handful of copies that date from, get this, a thousand years from the original writings. So Tacitus and the other Roman historians, they wrote, and then it was copied, 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 copied over hundreds and hundreds of years, 800 years, 1,200 years, uh, you know, that, that kind of ballpark. I mean, we're, we're dealing with stuff that we don't have the original copies. We have copies that are from way later in history, and we only have a few of them. And we trust that as being a credible record of this Caesar and that, you know, Greek battle and so on and so forth. Everything we know about the ancient world is based on that. Guess what we have with the New Testament? We have copies of New Testament books that date to within 100 years of the original writings. And we have hundreds, we have thousands of copies of these original, of, of, of being very close to the original sources. So it's the best attested textual context that we have to pull from. So if there's anything that you can be certain about in the ancient world, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's the stuff that we have the best historical credible evidence for. But people approach the Bible from the secular lenses already denying the existence of God and they go, well, resurrections don't happen. So there couldn't have been a resurrection. Well, then how do you explain the rise of Christianity overnight in the ancient world? How do you explain so many people across the, the, the Roman Empire coming to a knowledge of this, of, this, of this faith? Well, they have to rely on something like the disciples stole the body of Jesus, so there's an empty tomb that they can point to. They hid the dead body of Jesus away, and they all spread a fake new religion that they all died for as martyrs, 11 of the 12 apostles. Now, that's called a deathbed confession. Are you familiar with how in a court of law, a deathbed confession has very high value in terms of the validity and credibility of that testimony? You've got 11 of the 12 apostles went to their deathbed confessing they did see the resurrected Jesus and this is what they've dedicated their lives to. A life of sacrifice, a life of persecution, and ultimately a martyr's death. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't just those 12. The resurrected Jesus appeared to 500 people, at least, that Paul could count. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he's like, by the way, we've got 500 more people, witnesses, who saw the resurrected Lord, and they can testify the same. 500 eyewitnesses, 11 deathbed confessions, all this textual evidence dating right to on top of the event, an open tune and a religion that spread like wildfire. There just is simply no secular explanation for this. And that's why we can say this is unprecedented. And God made sure that we had all the evidence needed to know that his word is solid, that his word is to be believed. By the way, have you noticed how religions typically spread? The, the, the conquerors and nations impose their Caesar worship, their emperor worship through force. How did Christianity spread like that overnight? Through the conscience of the individual, for the reason of the individual choosing Jesus. Because the evidence is overwhelming, the love of God as shown in the cross of Jesus Christ, it, it, the love of God compels us, Paul says, to accept this message. Well, then there's the Messianic prophecies. You've seen in the Bible how many times the Bible referred to Jesus, the Messiah, coming. One mathematician decided, let's do a little exercise. 
And let's see how many, or what are the chances that one person would fulfill just eight of the Messianic prophecies. And he put in, his name was Peter Stoner, you can look up his calculations. He put in a lot of very uh, conservative things into this estimate. And we're only going to take eight of the dozens and dozens of Messianic prophecies. And we're going to see what are the chances one person would fulfill those. Well, he, what he found was, I, mean, I could give you the number like one in ten to the such and such power, but can I just use the analogy that, that, that will give you the chances of this? You take silver dollars, about this big, right? And you, you take the entire state of Texas and you place a silver dollar covering the entire state of Texas. Texas is big, by the way. Have you ever driven through it? It takes forever, right? Well, you cover the entire state of Texas. You mark one of those silver dollars with an X. Oh, and did I mention, you fill Texas two feet deep with silver dollars and cover it all two feet deep, one with an X, and then you drop a parachute down and see if you reach down and grab the one with an X. No way you're going to get that. So when we, as individual people with a mind, with a soul, heart, mind, and spirit, as Jesus said. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. When we come to the word of God and we say, Lord, I want to see that you are there and you're speaking to me. Is this for real? I'll tell you something. Not only do we rationally recognize this, but when we see the messianic prophecies point to a savior who died on the cross for our sins, that God doesn't just want to prove himself to you to satisfy the skeptic's mind so that, like, the evidence is overwhelming and I'm kind of cajoled into acknowledging it's true. That's not good enough, is it? He wants us to love him. He wants to show his love to us. And then we dedicate our lives to Jesus Christ out of the love for him that he's revealed at the cross. Can you go to Daniel 9? I want you to open in your Bibles to Daniel 9. You're going to love this prophecy and you're going to want to see it in your Bible. Now, while you're turning to Daniel 9, I'm going to tell you what Daniel's about to predict and you're going to go, no way was Daniel able to predict that. Okay, Daniel is about to tell you not only the messianic prophecies that he's going to die between criminals, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, that he's going to come into Jerusalem on a donkey, you know, all the messianic prophecies. He's going to show you the year the Messiah came. And Daniel has written hundreds of years before when Jesus came. He's going to show you, he's going to pinpoint the exact year that the Messiah would come and when he would die on the cross. You're like, that's impossible. If you've never seen this prophecy, this is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible because it shows so beautifully and clearly. By the way, an earlier chapter in Daniel, in chapter two, Daniel is able to, able to predict the empires that would follow the Babylonian Empire. When you're reading in Daniel, Daniel is a prophet of God, but he's also a captive in Babylon. And he's serving in the court of the king. And he tells the king, you're going to be followed by another empire that's inferior to you. And then after that will be another one, and after that will be another one. And you're like, well, that's not that impressive, right, to say there will be empires that follow one after the other. But then he says that fourth one in line isn't going to be conquered by another one, but will be divided. And then after that, and he's talking like hundreds and hundreds of years, a thousand years into the future, that after that fourth one, they're going to attempt to reunite the divided empire, but they will fail. And they're going to attempt to reunite through intermarriage, and that will fail. How is Daniel able to predict all that? We're going to study that one, actually, in a future session. But skeptics looked at Daniel, and they, they looked at Daniel 9, they looked at Daniel 2, and they're like, impossible. There's no way that this can be predicted with this level of precision. Predicting all the empires that would transpire, knowing the exact year that the Messiah would come, that's impossible. So they just said, well, we don't believe in inspiration. We don't believe in the supernatural. We have to conclude that Daniel was written centuries later than it claims to be, and that this was all faked, and it's pretending to be a prophet Daniel before Christ came. Well, then you know what happened? 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and copies of the book of Daniel, dating to hundreds of years, 200 plus years, before the events that are described, before Christ. So that's why, like, every, archaeologically, every archaeologic, archaeological discovery never debunks the Bible, but only confirms the Bible. They've been doing deep archaeological research in Israel for 150 years in the, in the Holy Land. And, and, and every time, we've found hundreds of connections to the ancient contextual 
uh, cultures of the Bible that you find in the earth. Like, why is it only ever confirming it? Well, the scholars used to say, oh, you're Hittites. You know, you're Hittites. Uh, they don't exist. And then they found the Hittites in the archaeology. Oh, you're King David. They don't exist. You Bible-believing people and your silly legends. Well, King David was found. And then they found Jericho and, and, and all the way down the line. At this point in, in, this, in the archaeological scholarship, it takes a leap of irrational faith to not believe in the historical Bible than to believe in it. Okay, let's read verse 24. The angel says to Daniel, you're like, Scott, you're going to do Daniel 9 in nine minutes? Yes, for the first time in history, Lord willing, because I'm up against the clock with the broadcast tonight. This is awesome. The, Dan the angel says to Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Who are Daniel's people and what is Daniel's holy city? This would be the Jews and Jerusalem who are in captivity in Babylon. And the angel says, you've got a 70-week time period for the Jewish nation to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So they've got a 70 week probationary period to repent, to experience God's plan for them once again. They're in captivity because they rebelled. God says in verse 25, there's going to be a command that you go back to your homeland and you're going to rebuild the city and you're going to restart your worship system. And you might be thinking 70 weeks. That's not a very long period of time. We'll see what that means in just a second. Let's go right to verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, so there's a starting point of the prophecy, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Messiah, oh, this is the messianic prophecy about when he comes. So from that command until the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Do you know a little math there? Threescore and two, that's King James for. 62, right? Seven weeks and three score and two weeks or 62. Seven plus 62 is 69 weeks. So Daniel was just told by the angel from the going forth of that command, the Messiah will come in 69 weeks. Wait a minute. That's only a little over 16 months. The whole nation has only 16 months to go back, rebuild the city, restart the worship system, have this whole reset. Well, <laughs> the, the Messiah didn't come 69 literal weeks from this prophecy. What is this 69 weeks? Well, there's two texts in the Bible that will help us understand. The Bible always interprets itself. The Bible always explains itself so we don't have to wonder. I have appointed the each day for a year. Each day for a year in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal what? Year, which makes the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 24, or chapter, uh, Daniel verse 24, Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy holy city, and then 69 weeks till the Messiah comes. So let's do a little math. What are the 70 weeks? 490 literal days, 490 days of prophecy, 490 literal years. So then we can calm down. Oh, no, in 483 days, the Messiah is coming. we got to get ready in only 16 months. No, 483 days is literally 483 years. Now let's go back into verse 25 here. Let's reread it. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, shall be that 70 weeks. Now, from the command, can we identify when in history the command was issued to restore and build Jerusalem? Because the Jews eventually go back to their homeland after this captivity. Who was it? It was the Persians that sent them back home here in Ezra 7.13. The decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was issued in 457 B.C. Ezra chapter 7 in verses 11 to 23 records the edict of the Persian king saying, Jews, you may go home to your homeland. We've got very good history outside of the Bible. The Persians were very meticulous record keepers as well. We've got good history on that. We've got a good history in the secular historical uh, profession to identify that date 457 B.C. is the starting date of the prophecy. So let's take it forward now. This is fun. 483 years from 
457 BC. Remember, it's not 483 days from, it's not 458 BC. That doesn't give the Jews enough time. It's 483 years later, takes us to 27 AD. Now, did the Jewish Messiah come in 27, did, did, did the biblical Messiah, did Jesus come in 27 AD? Well, what happened in 27 AD? Uh, first, do you know what the word Messiah means? It says in verse 24, the Messiah will come. That literally means the anointed one. Was Jesus anointed in 27 AD? The Holy Spirit came down like a dove at his baptism. And when did that take place? Luke chapter 3. Luke, great historian, great uh, writer of, of credible history here. He says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and he names Pilate and Herod being ruling at that time, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... 27 AD, and Luke chapter 3 is where it records Jesus' baptism. The anointing happened exactly, exactly as Daniel said it would, hundreds of years in advance. Think about that. I mean, we already were blown away by Galatians 4 verse 4, the second half of the verse, that God sent forth his son. Is that mind-boggling that the son of God left his heavenly throne, came to this earth to be born as a human, to live this Terrible life on this planet, being persecuted, being tempted in every way just as we are, and overcoming. He, was a, he lived a sinless life. His hard life he lived, and then not just that, dying for our sins on the cross. That's overwhelmingly mind-boggling to know that God sent forth his Son. And then when you see the first half of the verse, did you know the Bible says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. Jesus said it himself. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. So not only was the place of his birth foretold and so many things about his life, but the exact time of the Messiah. What more could we need? Um, by the way, the rest of that verse is important for us. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Because this asks something of us, not just to satisfy our intellectual curiosity so we can have a certainty that the Bible is credible and we have the right religion. It is asking, what is our faith? What is our religion? It is to repent, to believe the gospel. What is the gospel? Oh man, this is the best part of the prophecy. So far we're here. We're up to 483 years of the 490 year prophecy. We're up to AD 27 when Jesus was baptized in the fall. Now let's read in verse 26. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be, listen to these words, cut off. That means the death penalty, the death that goes beyond death. Your, your generations are cut off from God's people. Jesus had the death penalty for the sinner, but not for himself because Jesus didn't sin. Did you read those words? He shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's the gospel message right there. Unbelievable. Now look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant for many, with many, for how long? For one week. So we're in the last seven years that we haven't covered yet. And so this would be 27 AD till seven years after that would be 34 AD. So the last seven years. And in the midst of that last seven years, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Did something happen three and a half years after he was baptized that caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. The sacrifices of lambs no longer relevant because Jesus, the true lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, died and the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Christ, our Passover, died for us. Think about that. Jesus came to die for our sin. That, for me, for you, he was cut off but not for himself. Who was he cut off for? He was cut off for my sin. The ultimate reason to trust God's word is not just because reason demands it, but because there is no book, no religion, no faith, no philosophy on the face of the earth that reveals a God of love, Jesus Christ coming to this earth to die for your sin. Do you know the gospel message? We, we see the prophecy. We see how important that is for establishing the word of God as credible. It's authoritative. But that asks us to repent, doesn't it? Because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life because the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Accept Jesus Christ in your heart as we close in prayer tonight. Lord Jesus, we love you. You are our Savior and Lord. Your word is proven true. And we commit our lives to you right now. We say thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, for your unbelievable sacrifice at the cross. Our lives are yours. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.